This is Berkeley Talks, a UC Berkeley news podcast from the Office of Communications and Public Affairs that features lectures and conversations at UC Berkeley. You can follow Berkeley Talks wherever you listen to your podcasts. New episodes come out every other Friday. Also, we have another show, Berkeley Voices. This season on the podcast, we're exploring the theme of transformation. In eight episodes, we're looking at how transformation of ideas, of research, of perspective shows up in the work that happens every day at Berkeley. You can find all of our podcast episodes on UC Berkeley News at news.berkeley.edu slash podcasts. Uh, thank you all. Oh my God, look at the size of this crowd. Um, uh, you have to tell all of my students to uh, turn out like this. So uh, thank you. Thank you all for coming. Uh, I hope you had a chance to read our, our land acknowledgement. Uh, I think this is very important. Uh, and I, I want to welcome you all back uh, or welcome you here to, uh, to UC Berkeley. Uh, and uh, I'm just delighted that I was invited uh, to be part uh, of this wonderful weekend. Um, I started off with a, a title, Parlor Games, uh, Conspiracy Theory, Insurrection, and Computational Folkloristics, which I know is a mouthful, but so is my last name. Um, and uh, I, I had started off really by thinking about this in the context of a storytelling approach. And, and because I'm a folklorist, I work so much with storytelling and, and, and so much with um, uh, the way people... Uh, frame uh, belonging and not belonging, inside and outside. But then something happened in the news, um, and um, I realized uh, I, might, I might need to change the title uh, of my talk. Uh, and um, Poor little one on the right, huh? Uh, and then uh, it even got better because you almost never have a public figure endorsing the main premise uh, of your talk. Uh, and yet, uh, there it was. If I have to create stories so that the American media actually pays attention uh, to the suffering of the American people, then that's what I'm going to do. And so it was almost, I, I, mean, I kind of had to you know, say, you just stole my thunder. Uh, and so I was a little bit more angry at this individual for for taking uh, the whole premise of today's uh, talk, which is that stories uh, play an enormous role, both in the way we frame our understanding of the world around us, but also can inform our decision-making. Uh, and this is not a new phenomenon. This is something that's been going on for quite a while. So I want to start uh, with a story. Uh, remember, I'm a, I'm a folklore, so I'm going to bring us back to 19th century rural Denmark. Uh, and I want to tell you a story uh, actually that was collected uh, from a farmer uh, living out in Jutland, uh, which if you recall third grade Danish geography, uh, you know, is the peninsula of, of um, Denmark. Uh, and there's a group of hidden folk out there uh, down by the river uh, who menace the local population by stealing their pets and eating them. Uh, a guy told me the following. Uh, his father worked in Toistrup, and at that time the forest went all the way down to the town of Toistrup. Now there's practically a mile up to it, as you know. In the forest, there were elves who had hollows in their backs. They often came to him when he was a shepherd, and they tried to steal his bread from him. Uh, that's really what they wanted. Uh, they also went into... Okay, so just a side note. Have anybody been to Denmark? What is like the, yeah, yeah smarbrød, right? The open-faced sandwich. That's really what he's saying. They're trying to steal my open-faced sandwiches. So when he says they're trying to steal my bread, that's what he means. Just a footnote there. Apologize for that. Um, they also went into town and were bad about stealing there and taking the townspeople's cats. It said that they ate them. People had to watch out that their cats weren't alone in a room because then they would get snatched. And you think, okay, well, that's kind of an a, 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 a interesting story from the 19th century. But how does that uh, translate up into the present day? Well, fast forward to 1994 in Denmark, uh, in uh, the face of what uh, certain po uh, largely populist political parties were saying was a, a, an overwhelming influx of refugees and immigrants. Uh, and this is a story uh, that was collected by a colleague of mine. I heard the story about the dog that was stolen and eaten by immigrants about four years ago. It was in a circle of reasonable people, 
but the teller knew the people it happened to. These people took a talk with no, a walk with their dachshund. I, I think to now now it would be like your 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 French um, uh, bulldog, right? Um, uh, when all of a sudden a couple of immigrants snatched the leash out of their hands and disappeared with the dog. Uh, when the police found the culprits, dinner was just finished. The entire family was sitting around the table, and only the well gnawed bones were left. So. What do we get from this? Tradition and belief provide resonance across decades, if not centuries. Uh, like the hidden folk, uh, immigrants lead a life that's hidden from the, quote, native population. They have a separate culture and language. They work the least popular jobs, and there's minimal chance for assimilation into Danish culture. Often, then, physical characteristics set them apart from ethnic Danes. And keep that in mind, the idea of insider and outsider and the dehumanization uh, of outside groups is something that is constructed uh, through storytelling. And so that's a, a little uh, prelude into um, our, our talk today, where we're going to be looking at storytelling, folklore, and belief, uh, but we're going to look, be looking at it at a very large scale, um, uh, pretty much internet scale. Um, so... Just to remind you, because I know you all went to Cal or have some association with Cal, so you probably already know this, but uh, recall, um, if you haven't already remembered, that folkloristics is the study of vernacular, informal culture, uh, and its circulation on and across social networks. Uh, so you can think of your favorite social network, something like the Instagram, uh, I call it the Insta Snap Face, uh, TikTok. <laughs> Uh, in contemporary culture, this is going to have a lot in common with social media. The informal dimensions of everyday life are created, circulated, and negotiated, right? This is something that's very important where there's always a give and take, right? When I'm telling you a story, you might interrupt me, say that's not the way it goes. We're, we're constantly negotiating, you know, what is good, what is bad, uh, what we recognize as, as being important to our group. Um, I'm reminded of um, uh, the squirrel dance and Nose Sausage Day. Do many of you celebrate Nose Sausage Day? No, of course you don't. It's a stupid thing. Nobody would do that. It's not a thing that we celebrate. It creates no meaning. Nor do we do the squirrel dance. Um, and so, you know, what we're doing with storytelling is we're often trying to align things that create meaning for us uh, with the other people uh, in our group. So we're interested in these processes, dynamic processes of variation and stability, right? How and why do ideas persist? And how do these ideas support and create beliefs? Uh, we're also interested in the relationship between cultural expressive forms, groups, and the dynamics of group membership, right? Who gets to be inside? Who is outside? Uh, and ultimately, then, it means that folklore is remarkably efficient because it's circulating all the time and we're constantly involved in these negotiations. It's incredibly efficient at encapsulating and communicating cultural ideology. So things that you might think are innocuous or uh, don't have that much weight, actually, because of their commonality, are incredibly uh, laden with uh, beliefs, norms, and values where Norms are how you expect people to behave. Uh, beliefs are pretty much what you think the outcomes are going to be of, of those uh, behaviors. And values is simply a rank list uh, over uh, the outcomes uh, uh, of that system. So that's what stories do. That's what a lot of, uh, of our informal culture does. Uh, and it's, it's small packets uh, because we've, we've worked through it so much. Now, don't confuse belief with truth, whether it's justified or unjustified. Uh, belief is a social construct, and it influences, I think, in profound ways how we interpret facts, our understanding of how the world works. Now, we don't know the mechanisms yet. This is something that we're working on. Um, uh, it's, it's even hard to kind of measure belief, uh, but it's pretty clear uh, that storytelling plays an important role uh, in, uh, in this, partly because belief is often related to causal claims. Uh, another downstream effect of that, right, because belief is related to causal claims, 
it can influence the decisions that we make, right? I'm going to do this because I believe that. So you're thinking, what, <laughs> what the heck does this have to do with folklore? But I hope that I've brought you along, albeit quickly, to recognize that one of the things that folklore is so very good at doing is creating a group that recognizes in this communicative setting that we're part of a group and that we're now going to engage in some sort of conversational uh, interaction uh, that will help us align our little models of the world that we're all walking around with with the other person's little model of the world that they're walking around with. Uh, and then that might influence uh, the decisions that we make in the real world. All right, so you can think of the used car example. Uh, you're going to buy a used car. You've done all the research. You've decided that the best car for you um, is, uh, we're in Berkeley, so it's a Subaru Outback. Uh, uh, you're, you're absolutely sure that this is the best car for you, but you go out for drinks with a couple of friends of yours, uh, and one of them says, oh, yeah, now we just bought a, a, a Jeep Grand Cherokee, and it's just a fabulous car. And that weirdly blasts away all of your research and you go out and buy a, a Jeep Grand Cherokee, which uh, if my brother's experience is any, uh, 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 can give caution, then, uh, <laughs> then don't buy the Jeep Grand Cherokee. Really, you should stick with the Subaru. Uh, okay. uh, how does this go to legend and rumor? Well, legends, this is something that I work on quite a bit, is very closely related to rumors. There's sources of information that thrive in low trust or low information environments, or a combination of both, right? So if you don't trust uh, information sources, you're gonna to turn to your friends, family, your community to get that information. Uh, or if you don't have access to information, you're gonna ask the person next to you, hey, what the hell is going on? And I know many of you are thinking that you should turn to the person next to you in this lecture and go, huh, what the heck is going on? Um, Legend in this context should be seen as short, believable, mono, one, one thing happens, monoepisodic narratives, they're told as true, very informal settings, often conversationally, and rumor is simply a legend that has, to use the vernacular, gone viral. Now, rumor also has a, a feature that it pushes decision-making into the real world. So a legend is often told retrospectively, like the stories that I told you uh, at the very beginning of this lecture uh, about the uh, elves stealing people's cats and eating them or the immigrants stealing people's dogs and eating them. We know what happened. Uh, where rumor says, here's a threat, here's a problem. What are you going to do about it? Or what should we do about it? Um, and so I want to give you a little model uh, of, of legend structure. Uh, and... Uh, recognize that in rumor, this part here, result, uh, is often missing. Uh, so it basically has six parts, but only three are really essential. Uh, a lot of times you say, hey, did you hear what happened to my friend Bob? No, no, that's actually a real question. Do you guys? No, no, of course you didn't. No. Uh, and I can tell you, oh, yeah, no, you know Bob, right? This was last week down in... El Cerrito uh, at the Hotsi Totsi, the pub. Uh, so that kind of gives you a who, what, where, when. And we have that setting, and we, we already have established there an inside group, right? We all know Bob. We like Bob. He's a little bit weird, but we like Bob. Um, wondering what he's doing at the Hotsi Totsi, but that's okay, right? And then something happens. Um, and you have to, when something happens, you have to make a decision about what you're going to do next. Uh, and... Um, a lot of times there'll be an evaluation to say, oh my God, that happened to Bob. Uh, and then there's a result, what finally happened. One of the things I've always been um, uh, annoyed by is the complicating action is not terribly theorized. And so we came up with a model that breaks it into two distinct parts. Uh, basically, there's a threat or disruption, right? So we start a story, we've created a community, there's going to be some sort of threat or disruption, uh, and then we're going to come up with a strategy uh, for dealing with that, um, that threat or disruption. That's where it becomes ideological, right? It's basically asking, here's what's happened. What should we do about it? 
Uh, and here's a story about what people decided to do about it. Uh, and if the strategy succeeds, uh, then that kind of gets endorsed by the community. And if it fails, it gets rejected. I don't know if anybody's seen the film The Exorcist. I use this a lot uh, as an example. Um, uh, my wife got upset when I showed it to my children uh, when they were very young. I was like, no, no, it's research. Um, but recall The Exorcist, uh, which is a phrase I've always wanted to say in, in public. Um, the, the story starts with a broken family uh, and a movie star who moves to Washington, D.C. To, to, um, to film a movie. Uh, and uh, one morning, uh, while she's having her, her breakfast, uh, her daughter... Uh, spider walks down the stairs uh, spewing blood and speaking in a very uh, menacing voice. Uh, and as any parent, she thinks, oh, it must be a stomach flu. Uh, and so she gives, uh, she gives her child a little bit of um, Tylenol and, and some um, uh, Pepto-Bismol to... to, to that doesn't work. I don't know if you've ever looked at the labels uh, on, uh, on Tylenol and Pepto-Bismol. These are not for satanic possession. <laughs> so she does what, what any parent does, and she brings her child uh, to the doctor, right, the physician, the pediatrician. The pediatrician looks at Reagan and uh, checks her vitals and looks in her throat and says, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to... Uh, I'm going to prescribe some antibiotics. And again, really, the doctor should have been pre pre uh, prescribing anti-satanics, not antibiotics, because again, th those fail. So the next thing we see is she's Reagan's being uh, uh, examined by a whole room of experts. Uh, and the experts come up with all sorts of theories, and they're all wrong. Now, fortunately for this mom, she's right near Georgetown University, which has an excellent department of exorcism uh, down in the... <laughs> basement floor of one of the uh, buildings there. And she goes and she finally finds an exorcist. Uh, and the exorcist is weirdly successful, although he dies in the process of exorcising uh, Satan from little Reagan. Um, but what's interesting then is that uh, she goes back uh, to Hollywood. Uh, uh, I believe they get married again. Uh, and Reagan probably lives happily ever after. This is a strongly ideological uh, uh, film. So if you look through all of the strategies, they try all of the strategies of modern science, and it's not until they come to the Catholic strategy, we're not really Catholic, but the strategy of using a Catholic priest for exorcism uh, that, the, uh, that, that Reagan is cured. So there is this ideological component to strategies uh, and, uh, and application. So just very quickly, we have this, this model that we have to use. We have to have a formalism a, a formalization of this model so that we can apply uh, computational methods to it. And um, looking at my time, I think I'm just going to show you the slides, but not tell you uh, what's on them. Uh, <laughs> I'm a professor. We do this all the time. It's just like, wait. <laughs> uh, uh, how is this on the exam? It's like, oh, no, it's in the slides. Um, <laughs> This brings us to the idea of narratives of threat and the role of fear. Um, the complicating action is often going to propose a threat or disruption that is linked to the shared fears or concerns of a group. Now, remember, this is dynamic. So those are negotiated over time. What are we afraid of as a group? Uh, and a strategy to deal with that threat or disruption is culturally acknowledged as potentially efficacious. Right? So the strategy that you come up with, that, that mom comes up with for Reagan, yeah, seems that that could work, but it doesn't. Right? This is the Ghostbusters problem. Does anybody recall this classic film? It's a classic of modern cinema. It's called The Ghostbusters. I don't know what they say in French. I'm sure it's Les Ghostbusters. Uh, anything that's important we say in French in the humanities. Um, uh, what does the Ghostbusters ask is one of the most profound questions uh, of the 20th century. Who are you going to call? Who are you going to call? Yeah. But it's before that, when ghosts appear in the neighborhood, when there's a threat or disruption, who are you going to call? And the answer to that question is always going to be ideological. You can either take it on yourself. You can call an expert. Uh, you can band together and do something. But that 
is really a fundamental aspect of uh, a lot of these stories. So if we're looking at stories that are told as true, uh, that are circulating widely in a community, many of them are about some sort of threat or disruption. And then the, then the storytelling starts to explore strategies for dealing with that threat or disruption. So if we can catalog these narratives, we can get an idea of uh, the various sources of threat or disruption, right? That'll tell us a lot about the group. Uh, the various strategies proposed for dealing with those threats or disruptions, also incredibly good information, and then the outcome of applying those strategies to those threats or disruptions. Um, and by doing that, we're going to learn a great deal about the group in which those stories circulate. One of the questions I've had is actually why so much fear, and this is some research that we're doing uh, along with some neuroscientists. Uh, it might well be that there are uh, circuits uh, in the brain that are highly attuned to trying not to get eaten. Uh, and uh, at the first perception of threat, uh, a circuit turns on. Uh, and as we try to get more and more information, that channel uh, might get uh, modulated. So it's a slower channel. Uh, and so there might be some neurophysiological relationship to uh, belief and threat narrative. So that's uh, research that we just gotten funding, funding for and uh, greatly uh, interested to see if we come up with anything. Um, so that brings us to social media uh, and storytelling. Um, now, you probably recall uh, from philosophy classes, uh, George Boole, uh, the famous philosopher and also logician, uh, he says in every discourse, whether of the mind conversing with its own thoughts or of the individual as intercourse with others, there is an assumed or expressed limit within which the subjects of its operation are confined. So this, in some ways, gives us an idea of domain, right? So that when we start talking about um, uh, Jeep Grand Cherokees and Subaru Outbacks were probably unlikely uh, to be also talking about um, uh, spaceships and, and Martians, right? So there's some limits to what can be admissible uh, into a conversation. So one of our goals then is to, in any social media conversation, try to estimate uh, what those limits are of the conversation uh, and also try to understand the relationships uh, between the entities in that conversation. Now, if you spend any time on social media, you've discovered that posts are notoriously fragmentary. People are referring to conversations that started long before, uh, earlier threads, other forums, other platforms. Uh, it really is like parachuting into a conversation and you have no idea what's going on. So we're going to try and use uh, computational methods to find out what's going on without having to read uh, all of these posts because there are tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of posts. You can't actually do it. But in the aggregate, for any sort of domain, these posts and discussions should constitute a collaborative storytelling process resting on some underlying narrative framework. So that's, that's our assumption. Um, and this means that we can start to do some things. We can find all of the uh, characters uh, and places uh, in the stories that are being referred to on social media, uh, and we can maybe estimate whether those are insiders or outsiders. Uh, we can maybe figure out the negotiations over what happened, the complicating action. Did it, uh, did it constitute some sort of threat or disruption? The origin and status of potential threats uh, and perhaps consideration of potential strategy, strategies. And if there is an end result that the social media people contact, uh, can comment on, then maybe we'll also be able to get this retrospective evaluation of end results and how that then fits into this narrative world. Now, there's some things that you have to be careful about uh, when you work with social media and uh, virtual communities online. Uh, there's an illusion of what I would call close homogeneous communities. Close homogeneous communities, those are, those are the communities that you're familiar with from everyday life. These are people that you share values with. You may not agree with them. Um, uh, Thanksgiving is always a good uh, uh, opportunity to explore disagreements in close homogeneous groups. Um, uh, but you're brought together by shared beliefs, values, norms, which I consider ideology. Um, 
And there's a, they're marked by degrees of what we call homophily. That's simply birds of a feather flock together, right? So you're more likely to gravitate towards people who you share something in common with. Uh, real life communities may, however, require a little bit more give and take. And they may have what I call social breaks associated with them. Things travel a little bit more slowly. And if I start uh, spouting off about the Illuminati and um, uh, space lasers and things like that, people will say, Tim, that, that's not a real thing, and they'll all move away from me in the bar, right? And so as, as social beings, we like to be with people who share our values, but in, in, in real life social settings, there's a, a degree of um, uh, slowness, right? Which is necessary. On, on virtual communities, it's at the speed of uh, light or very close to it. Uh, and the community that you're uh, interacting with uh, may not actually be uh, what you think it is. Uh, in fact, in real life, um, and we can think about Bob going to the Hotsi Totsi, you avoid sitting down to pizza and beer with malevolent robots. Uh, on social media, you actually do not know if you have not just sat down to the equivalent of pizza and beer with a bunch of malevolent robots. So what? Uh, stories and action. I think this is really important. Stories uh, give a basis and a justification for people to take real life uh, action. Uh, they can be uh, retrospective justification, but they can also be motivating justification. Here's what's happened, what should we do about it? Um, uh, famous French theorist proposes that stories represent uh, repertoires of schemas of action, right? So you could have collective exploration uh, of those schemas. How should we act uh, given a particular situation? Uh, and Ann Swidler mentions that stories present a toolkit uh, of habits, skills, and styles. So that allows a group to figure out how we as a group should react to what we might see as a disruption or uh, as, as a threat. And so one of the reasons why I think that is so what uh, is that, for example, people believed many of the COVID conspiracy theories because of the storytelling environments in which they were embedded. Right? So it's much more the storytelling uh, uh, than anything else. Uh, and that's how Bill Gates actually, and you'll see in just a moment, uh, becomes effectively Satan. Um, and so this brings us to the realm of experimental computational folkloristics, three words that nobody ever thought would be uttered uh, together uh, <laughs> in public. Uh, um, like so many things, Berkeley is at the forefront uh, of, of this field as well. Uh, and this is where we start to unravel uh, narrative at internet scale. So one of the things that's kind of interesting, if we start to think about conspiracy theories, is you've all heard little bits of these uh, in different places. But what a conspiracy theory is able to do is to take simple threat narratives and link them together to form complex representations of threatening groups and their interconnections. So we're really, has anybody ever seen those shows that have like, um, uh, either the detective or uh, the lunatic in their, their basement with what we call a wall of crazy. <laughs> yeah. So all those pictures of people and, you know, red thread going between all of the different pictures and then these great big questions uh, and usually a slogan over the top of the wall of crazy, like the truth is out there. Um, so we want to estimate those walls of crazy for any social media group. Uh, and um, <laughs> as we started doing this work, we discovered that these walls of crazy, these what we call narrative frameworks, have a huge amount of stability uh, across time once they're established. So it didn't surprise me when I heard someone using in a political uh, speech talking about, quote, the threat of immigrants to say that they're eating the dogs and cats, they're eating their pets. Uh, because as I showed you at the very beginning of this talk, those stories have been in circulation for a very, very long time and in very different places as well. So one of our questions was, how are these networks held together? 
Are there certain topological features of the narrative framework that tell us something about narrative belief in community? Are there certain features of narrative framework topologies that are more important uh, in solidifying ideology? So we had to come up with a model, uh, and I've already given you the basis of it. Uh, and so what we did was we said, well, all of the actants, these are the people, the institutions, the, the places that interact in these stories can be the nodes in the network. And the pairwise or multiple uh, multi-way relationships can be the edges, right? So we're going to create an, a giant network representation uh, of these domains. Um, these relationships are going to be context dependent, dependent of others, health, politics, power, corruption, religion, etc. And then we come up with this very simple little pipeline of interlocking uh, computational methods. Uh, you can kind of immediately see what we were doing um, uh, to uh, extract these uh, social media network uh, narratives. Uh, and then we, we run some uh, algorithms to try and find the groupings in this very large network space. And those are the individual narrative communities that have been linked together. Uh, and so we did a series of experiments on this. Uh, we looked at anti-vaccination movements. We looked at the rise of QAnon. Uh, we looked at conspiracy in the time of COVID-19. Uh, for the anti-vaccination narratives, uh, where we were really focused on what are called mommy blogs, we discovered that, interestingly, vaccines were not the threat. Right? So if vaccine-preventable diseases are the threat, the obvious strategy is vaccinate. If vaccine-preventable diseases aren't the threat, if instead vaccines are the threat, then the obvious strategy is don't vaccinate. So then a lot of the discussions were, how can we not vaccinate? And that's how you start to get these exemption narratives uh, taking over. Incredibly stable once these beliefs were, were, were found, uh, once they started to emerge. Uh, stable over nine years, uh, even though all of the membership of these mommy blogs had long cycled off, right? So they got picked up by new members to the blogs uh, afterwards. Uh, we looked at Pizzagate uh, and the rise of QAnon. Uh, and one of the things that we found was that um, domains that don't have any real connection were being connected by people interpreting, in this case, a source of information, the WikiLeaks dump uh, of emails. So casual dining, democratic politics, the Podesta brothers, uh, and Satanism, which really don't have that much to do with each other, right? Casual dining does not immediately make you think of Satanism. Or if it does, come see me afterwards. I, I want to talk to you, uh, include you in one of our studies. Um, uh, but through these narrative linkages, they all of a sudden became, and you can see in the projection there, one big narrative network. If we removed all of the edges coming from WikiLeaks, the narrative network would fall apart. Um, during COVID-19, we saw something else happening. A bunch of different stories all of a sudden started to get linked together uh, via things like Bill Gates, uh, cells, cell phones, little semantic weirdness going on there, and 5G. Um, uh, and, and feeding into uh, the QAnon uh, narrative. Um, so that was kind of a, a, an interesting um, situation to discover that we can find these narrative networks, we can understand what is seen as a threat, we can see who's inside, who's outside, and we can start to see ideas of strategies for dealing with those threats. We can also see that topologically, these networks are incredibly um, fragile, Right? They're not robust. Uh, you can delete parts of them and they just fall apart. Very different from an actual conspiracy like Bridgegate. In Bridgegate, you could have deleted all of the actors. You could have taken out all of the people who were involved in Bridgegate and New Jersey politics would have continued without missing a beat, for better or worse. I don't know how you feel about New Jersey politics. Um, but with Pizzagate, if we deleted the edges coming from WikiLeaks, the entire narrative framework would just fall apart. The problem like that is in another film, uh, has anybody seen Terminator 2? Yeah, fabulous movie. So what happens to the Terminator? 
if you shoot him a lot, falls down, right? But is very easily able to reconstitute itself. So we say that these conspiracy theories are not robust, but they're incredibly resilient, right? So even if you attack them at the level of these wall of crazy edges, it's very easy to put those edges back in. And so that brings us to a conspiracy based on a conspiracy theory, uh, January 6th, uh, and uh, a parlor. Uh, that's just a quick timeline going in backwards order uh, as to what happened. And this postage stamp is not actually a postage stamp. Yeah. Can I just ask, what do you mean by delete a... Oh, yeah. So uh, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, what do I mean by delete an edge? So we, we, we've estimated this narrative framework, which is we're, we're showing as a graph, right? So nodes and edges. Some of those edges are only coming into the graph because people are saying from the WikiLeaks dump, uh, I found this connection, right? So there are low probability edges that have been added in from the, uh, from the discussions themselves. Uh, if we can find those edges, in this case in Pizzagate, it was really easy. These were edges coming from the interpretation of WikiLeaks. We could delete those edges, right, uh, experimentally, right, just experimentally. What happens to the network if we delete those edges? It falls apart into very distinct conversations, casual dining, democratic politics, and Satanism, right? So yeah, great question. Um, the postage stamp is not a postage stamp. That's an AI generation of a postage stamp uh, with the prompt, uh, make a postage stamp commemorating January 6th. And that's what it came up with, uh, a little bit terrifying. Um, so we looked at Parler. We took the entire dump of Parler. Uh, and uh, if you don't remember Parler, it was uh, self-described as a haven for patriots. Uh, not much used until uh, November 10th, uh, when Stop the Steal was banned from most sort of big social media platforms. And everybody uh, from that, those groups uh, flocked to uh, flocked to Parler. Uh, it called itself a harbor for free speech, uh, which um, uh, is an interesting uh, interpretation of free speech. Uh, you could post or parley up to a thousand characters. It went abruptly offline on January 10th, partly because it was being used as one of the main planning uh, platforms uh, for the events uh, of January 6th. Uh, just before it went offline, somebody had uh, the idea to check how secure the, uh, the platform was. Uh, and the answer was not secure at all. So they dumped all of the data uh, from Parler and, and made that available to researchers. We didn't use any of the uh, user information in our work. We were mostly just interested in what were the conversations going on there. This is just some idea of the volume. The volume was absolutely massive. So we had to sample over it. Uh, and then what did we do? Uh, we downloaded the Parler set. Uh, we discovered the actants and their relationships. Um, you can't really see it. It's kind of a cool picture. I want to make it as a poster. Is there a way to turn off the lights? Up? Anyway, not that important. That is a cool picture. Um, yeah, yeah. Playing with them randomly is kind of cool. It gives a little light show. Yeah, you just kind of get it. It's a little bit better. Um, uh, uh, we consolidate some of these. We do, we do some magic with computers. Uh, and then we generate a, a series of narrative framework graphs. We're trying to understand what the story was and how it evolved over the time from uh, November 10th uh, to January 10th. Uh, and so we wanted to um, take this graph apart, see what was sort of at the basis of it, uh, and then uh, also uh, try and understand what people were talking about. Uh, so we used some AI um, stuff here called Vert Topic, uh, and we generated labels on the various communities. Uh, we found some main actants, not surprisingly, Biden, Trump, uh, then some slightly more surprising people, Sidney Powell, Scott Fitzgerald, Lynn Wood, Hunter Biden was already there. Uh, and if we go over here, we see uh, China, Republicans, God, uh, President uh, Trump and Obama. So you can, you can see already from this estimate what people are talking about uh, on Parler. 
When we go down to what is generating the edges and uh, we label the, uh, the groupings of, of sentences uh, related to these edges, we see a huge amount of discussion of uh, Antifa and Black Lives Matters, treason, traitor. You can see all of these groupings here. Those are based on uh, some similarity uh, in uh, what we call a, a word embedding space. So the, the assignation of Democrats to treason uh, and to um, outsiders uh, is unequivocal. Uh, and then there's uh, another whole group uh, of uh, discussions uh, uh, linked to things like uh, Islam and Muslims, uh, abortion, uh, pedophile, uh, and uh, weirdly also, well, not weirdly, actually, uh, the Catholic Church here. So you can, you can see these groupings of the, the different narratives that are, that are characterizing this parlor domain. Uh, the topics over time kind of march up and down intact with political events. Uh, and if we look at the very beginning of this, we can already see that, um, that, the, um, that the discursive space has put Democrats uh, uh, as uh, a satanic uh, and um, as leftist and as socialist, right? So you've, you've already constructed a threat narrative from the very beginning. Everything that happens afterward is based on uh, the Trump group uh, and quote patriots uh, as the insiders and what are we gonna do to beat back the threat that's constructed narratively uh, of these other groups. Um, and uh, when Flynn gets this pardon, uh, this is when um, there's a, a, an enormous amount of interest in, in then taking it to the streets uh, and, um, and really uh, going to war, literally, uh, with, um, with the democratic threat, right? So this is, this is not, it's not subtle, right? There's, there's nothing subtle in any of these graphs. What's interesting is that in these millions and millions of posts, we're able to find these different signals and we're already able to see early on uh, that there is uh, a convergence on a strategy of uh, forceful uh, and violent uh, response to what has largely been then framed uh, as a, uh, a theft uh, of um, the election. Um, and so here is probably uh, when Clark writes his letter to Georgia, you really see this, 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 um, this very clear uh, condensation uh, of that narrative uh, of uh, the Democrats stealing an election uh, from Trump uh, and that it really is a, an opportunity for patriots to kind of come to the savior, salvation of the uh, American people. Um, it's, it's, it's not terribly nuanced, but a lot of these stories aren't nuanced. You don't necessarily need nuance to get people uh, to take real world action. We go through this uh, and ultimately uh, find um, that, that on January 6th, there is, there is an insurrection. We've already seen, starting already on November 14th, uh, organizing about something to happen uh, right around uh, the beginning of January, narratively. Um, what's interesting is in the aftermath of January 6th, how quickly the narrative flips, right? So that it's not something that we're doing as a strategy uh, to uh, right or wrong, but rather that it's a, that January 6th was largely a false flag operation uh, with uh, Antifa in cahoots with the Capitol Police. It just, it just pops out of these narrative graphs. This is not, there's no secondary analysis going on here. These are just the nodes and the relationships. And we see that in the aftermath, right, there's then a, a very strong conversation narrative that tries to correct uh, what actually uh, happened. So it's kind of a revisionist history. Conversations on Parler were ideologically consistent throughout. There's very little room for dissent. It was basically an echo platform. New events that came in were fit into the existing belief framework uh, and the existing belief framework drove real-world actions. There was a rapid escalation 
to organizing for violent inter intervention early on, and Democrats were seen as an existential threat from the start. Uh, they brought in fears of technology, communism, socialism, and race. Uh, and in all of these graphs, we see that Trump and the patriots are aligned with God. Uh, the actions were seen as patriotic, supported by Trump God, and violence was justified, necessary, uh, and a very strong what's called Christian nationalist movement slant to a lot of these conversations. So what else are we doing? We're trying to understand these narrative groupings at this very large scale. You have to understand that these things can flip-flop very easily. Semantically, they're, it's very easy uh, to change uh, the story. I think that tech will kill me, right? So tech, we're trying to figure out what is an insider, what is an outsider. Uh, and so we've done some, um, some work trying to figure out, parsing at the level of sentences, what the person, the message that is being sent. And when we do this uh, over uh, the COVID-19 data set, uh, we find sort of uh, an insider group here where faith, family, and American is sort of super insider, uh, and uh, uh, billionaires, uh, the rushed vaccine, and politics are the, the real outsiders. Weirdly, Mussolini uh, is, is, is oddly close to the middle, uh, and we don't know what's going on with that. We have no idea um, what he's doing there. We actually don't know what he's doing there, uh, but Mussolini was very prominent in the COVID-19 discussions. Um, and then, you know, one of the questions is, you know, while a friend of a friend is a friend uh, and an enemy of an enemy is a friend, uh, what is a friend of an enemy, right? So this kind of incomplete information and act and alignment in, in narrative networks is what we're working on uh, as well right now. Uh, in the process of storytelling, we try to categorize groups or groups of people. And so part of that negotiation of the storytelling is trying to figure out where they fit in the scale of insider to outsider. Uh, and uh, can we do this with just sort of uh, freeform text? Uh, and so we were playing around with, with different discussions, uh, in this case about gun control, uh, and trying to understand uh, the, the differences between uh, groups, not so much based on overt statements, but on implicit statements uh, in this work. And our final work is actually trying to work on graph summary, because you saw some of these graphs were so big uh, that it's hard to really get a sense of what's going on in those uh, graphs. So we want to take apart the graphs and understand the semantics, not so much just of the topology of the graph, but the semantics of the stories being passed. So uh, we've done this both for Parler uh, and uh, have some great uh, visualizations of but the math is, is perhaps beyond uh, what we want to go into right now. It's on Friday afternoon after all, but I'll, I'll, I'll give you the, uh, the online quiz next week and you'll actually have to solve the equations. I apologize. Uh, but we also did it for, for French uh, Twitter. Uh, and what was interesting with French Twitter uh, is we found, you know, we could find these same types of insider outsider, but the labels on what was considered insider or outsider, what were the main threats were, were significantly different from those in the American. That, that, that's kind of confirmatory that our, our method is working, but it's also not terribly surprising. So positive directions. Are there anything good that can come of this? And that's, that's something I think is very important as a humanities scholar and, and just as a human being. I already know that we can use it for bad, right? It's very easy. We can take our models, give the model to ChatGPT after sampling over the graph and create valid posts, attach those to some robots, and we might actually be able to hasten the end of the world, right? So certainly use it for bad. Um, a great deal of attention in the study of inf uh, misinformation and disinformation uh, has been trying to attack the misinformation itself. Uh, and the problem is, is that you get minor effects, but they don't persist. My curiosity is, can we use the structure of the storytelling that I've just belabored now for almost an hour to change the conversation? Can we question exclusionary ideas about who belongs and turn them into more inclusive ideas in the storytelling itself, right? So um, move towards telling uh, uh, stories uh, that are inclusive as opposed to exclusive. Uh, 
can we question ideas of what is threatening? Uh, is it the vaccine preventable diseases or is it the vaccines? Uh, I think the vaccine preventable diseases are probably more threatening. Is there a way that I can change the discussion of threat and disruption? Can I change the strategies? Can I develop ways to steer conversations to more inclusive and less destructive strategies? If people are eating the dogs and cats, they must be hungry. So what can I do to uh, alleviate hunger in those communities, right? There's different ways of approaching this. It doesn't have to be just, oh, that's disinformation. You can, you can actually, uh, in, in, in positive ways, nudge the storytelling in different ways. And then maybe we can change the results, right? So that it isn't, that was a, a false flag operation, right? You can reshape the narrative so that one gets to an outcome with a net social good uh, for everyone. So thank you so much for listening. Yes, I think we have time to uh, entertain some questions. I'm not sure if I'll be able to answer them, but I'll certainly try to entertain them. You had your hand up first, yes? I understand all about the mythology and storytelling, but not once did you mention lies and how you deal with the concept of lies being the basis for a story. Right, so this, this goes to beliefs, right? So right. This, is, this, is, this is the, 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 the difference between beliefs and truth, right? And so in a lot of communities, we come up with, we come up with at times, completely contradictory sets of beliefs. Uh, and from some uh, standpoint, we might look at those as, as purely lies. Now, there are certainly people who are injecting lies into conversations for uh, malign uh, purposes. Didn't have time to go into that whole branch of, of, of the discussion there, right? One of the questions is, to, to what extent am I what are my, my goals of telling those lies? Is it something that I'm doing uh, deliberately, right? And I think lie suggests deliberate intent, whereas belief is something I, I might be, I might have a belief and it's a strongly held belief that for somebody else is like, that's just, I can't use the word, but BS, right? Yeah, so th there, there's a tension there. Uh, and it, it's one that, that might go to the intent of the teller. Yeah, so good point. You had your hand up, then you, and then you. The, uh, when you're assessing this data, yeah. are you doing it by, by date so you can kind of track, uh, you can see a change when it's like, oh, this date, the, right. when it looks like things are going to happen on January 6th? Yeah, so we have, we have some change point detection methods where we can uh, see where um, either something that is, there's a change in the narrative structure that front runs an event that we discover you know, later on happened, so it could be predictive. Uh, and then we can also find change points that are that are uh, subsequent to events. So that that's an important consideration. Yeah, we we, we gather as much time varying you know data as we possibly can. So everything's time stamped, uh, actually down to the minute or actually probably a second. So what but, was the time when you, when you thought things were going to happen? Well, we have we have a whole we have a whole that's, yeah. So that you, it, some of the things front ran uh, events. So January 6th was, was wildly anticipated. We already see that something was going to happen there. There were other things that were completely reactive. Uh, so the million MAGA match then led to a spike in, in conversations about we should do that again. Yeah. I think there was a, well, I think, were you next? And then the question in the back, yeah. Um, are you able to find uh, evidence of a conspiracy behind all the conspiracy theories? <laughs> uh, well, we do know we do know that yeah, it's a great question uh, and and one that we're really interested in. Uh, we do know that there was a conspiracy, uh, and it was in plain sight on Parler uh, to to react uh, en masse and violently on January six, right? And that's a reaction to a conspiracy theory. Uh, we were really interested in: is there a topological difference in the storytelling? Uh, that comes out in drips and drabs when a conspiracy is found. Because recall, a conspiracy, their whole goal is to never be found out. That's the point of a conspiracy, right? Um, so you have to sort of wait for the, the narrative to come out. It takes a very long time for you to actually estimate what the, the underlying narrative is of something like Bridgegate. It took years, right? Whereas a conspiracy theory seems to jump uh, into a, like a fully formed uh, state very, very quickly, uh, 
kind of QAnon doesn't really get much added to it after about six weeks, right? There's manipulation, blah, blah, blah. There's not really much being added to it, right? So there's, partly that's because it's storytelling, right? You can create the whole universe in story very quickly. It's very hard uh, to, to conspire uh, and not get caught, right? So, so yeah, that's, that's actually uh, something that we're working on. You had a question back here. Two parts. You answered part of the first one. Yeah. The predictive model, model quality. Mm -hmm. I've seen a lot about the metric uh, perspective of the thing. Are you finding it successful as a predictive model, similar to like probably trends on Twitter or something? Is that kind of what you're seeing when you develop something like this? And then the second question is for those that use this um, for nefarious activities, like I don't know. North Korea or a government that wants to do something and create conspiracies, do they use these kind of predictive or, or computational models to analyze what would be the best kind of disinformation to spread uh, based on how right it is for um, acceptance? Yeah, so um, answer to the second question first, uh, yes. Um, I mean, that's the simple answer, but yeah, no, they're obviously uh, using these kinds of models. But there's also a brute force element to it. You do, you pump out a lot of stuff and, and see what sticks. It's sort of like the spaghetti uh, cooking model where, you know, you keep testing to see if it's going to stick. Uh, but they're getting better, right? And so once you've estimated what the domain is for a community, it's very easy to generate posts that fit the pre-existing uh, the, the pre-existing parameters of the model. Uh, and then uh, reinforce those using uh, bots, right? So the, the thing is reinforcement actually makes things stick. The more you see something, the more likely it's going to stick. The first one is predictive modeling. Um, can we predict when something is about to happen? Um, we, can, we can predict uh, what a range of potential strategies are that people are talking about. Uh, we wouldn't be able to predict whether or not somebody is going to actually do that. So, yeah. Yes? I'll let this be the last question. Oh, you left okay. us hanging. What yeah. happened to Bob at the Hotsi Totsi? <laughs> uh, we, that's only, you know, uh, we'll have to go out for a beer and we'll talk about that. He's doing okay now, though. I mean, he's fine now. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Well, um, we've been cut off by our, our hosts. Uh, I think we all have to leave. And, uh, no, we don't have to leave. We, we can stay for a few more minutes. Okay. There, there, there's a question here, and then there's a question in the back, and we'll make that one. As we go all the way to the back, we'll make that the last one because that's the back wall, and there's nothing you beyond it. it. You got into this a little bit with the before and afters, but yeah. um, you mentioned not that people shouldn't be sitting down to have pizza with a, a what is it, a malignant uh, bot. A malevolent, a malevolent uh, robot, robot, yeah. What, how frequent, what percentage is the bots versus real people? Oh, <laughs> it depends on the platform. Uh, shockingly high. Uh, there's a there's a wonderful uh, tool out of uh, Indiana called Bot or Not, uh, and it gives you a bot profile for Twitter accounts. Uh, and there's certain things that bots used to do uh, that uh, were kind of predictable. Unfortunately, the people who control bots, uh, and you could control bots if you'd like, uh, discovered, read the paper. And it's very clear, they read the paper uh, because bots stopped, it, stopped uh, behaving that way, right? So they added more sort of stochasticity. Um, I'm pretty sure that this narrative generative framework, this generative narrative framework has definitely sort of also made its way back into malevolent hands, you know, would also like to see if it, it, it can have some benevolent uh, or positive uh, effects as well. You got to be careful. You don't want to get involved in, in social engineering. It gets really weird really quickly, right? But at least now we know some of the mechanisms, at least narrative mechanisms, that are driving some of these conversations. Very last question there in the back. These narratives are still going on today. Where do we go from here? Well, I mean, you know, as far as storytelling, that's that's something that makes us human, right? We're always we're always telling stories. There might be little stories, there might be in seemingly insignificant stories, but that's the way we create community. That's the way we 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 gauge, you know, how people around us are feeling and thinking. Um, now, uh, some stories uh, have been weaponized, but this is n nothing new, 
right? Stories have been weaponized, you know, for a very, very long time. Uh, and you can get people to think badly about other groups very quickly uh, through stories. You can also, hopefully, um, uh, get people to think good uh, about other groups. Uh, I mean, you know, the inscription on the Statue of Liberty really is one of these wonderful, inclusive gestures. And that becomes part of a grand narrative that, you know, the United States is a welcoming uh, country for, for immigrants and refugees. It's a, the whole premise uh, of, you know, economic and, and uh, social development, right? So it's also kind of the premise of, of, of the public land-grant universities, of which Berkeley is a, a great example, right? So we can tell stories that, 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 that lift people up. A lot of stories are about fear and threat. Uh, and that might just be something physiological. Uh, but can we nudge those stories in ways where the fear and threat is dissipated, not through some strategy of exclusion or violent action, but really through a strategy of inclusion? Great, thank you so much for listening. You've been listening to Berkeley Talks, a UC Berkeley news podcast from the Office of Communications and Public Affairs that features lectures and conversations at UC Berkeley. Follow us wherever you listen to your podcasts. You can find all of our podcast episodes with transcripts and photos on UC Berkeley news at news.berkeley.edu slash podcasts. 